Good afternoon and welcome back to the Paris Peace Forum. My name is Katie Lee. I am a technology reporter at the international news agency Agence France Presse, AFP, here in Paris. And I will be your host for what promises to be a fascinating conversation over the next 45 minutes. Our topic today is artificial intelligence, challenges and opportunities for policymakers. How can we reconcile algorithms and inclusive policies? Algorithms have become part of the fabric of our society in so many ways, determining everything from who gets out of prison to what we see in our social media feeds. And it feels like we have barely scratched the surface, both in terms of their potential and in terms of their risks, as we really start to enter the AI age. So there are a lot of questions here for policymakers. How can we make this technology work for us? And how can we make sure that people don't get hurt? With me to discuss these difficult but very intriguing questions are three very excellent guests. Caitlin Croft Buckman, the CEO and founder of Women at the Table, an organization that pushes for gender equality through the use of technology. Gavin Bassé, she is head of the OECD's Artificial Intelligence Policy Observatory. And Julie Iwono, Executive Director of Internet Without Borders. Welcome to all of you. And uh, can I say what a pleasure it is to be moderating this all women panel, which is depressingly rare in the field of technology. Uh, before we get started, a quick note to those of you in the audience. We would really like this conversation to feel lively and interactive. So you are thoroughly encouraged to get involved and ask questions to our panelists. The Q&A will be in the last 10 minutes of our conversation but you can ask them at any time. So as you're listening, if there's a question that comes to mind, please enter it into the chat, which you will find just to the side of the screen. And please, if you are asking a question, do try to specify who the question is directed to. So we're looking forward to hearing from you in the audience, but without further ado, let's hear from the panel members. And to kick off our conversation, a lot of people listening today would have seen quite grim examples of cases where artificial intelligence has shown itself to be sexist or racist. There have been cases, for example, of resume sorting tools that have been found to favor male candidates or software in the criminal justice system that recommends much more often that white prisoners are offered parole than black prisoners. Uh, Judy, why don't we start with you? Why does AI keep producing these kinds of racist and sexist results? Uh, Julie, I think it's not just me. I thought it might be just me, but uh, I'm getting a note from technical support yeah. that they also can't hear you. Sorry about that. Yeah. Is there a problem with your speaker, perhaps? Apologies for that. <laughs> Apologies for that. You're back. I had a brief without being unmuted, but I forgot. Apologies. Just wanted no to thank you it happens again to us and thank you, Jim. <laughs> so I was just saying, well, the machines are just a product and the mirror of our societies. Um, technology does not happen by chance. It's a result of choices. It's a result of processes. It's a result of decisions that have been made. And it's also a result of how, who are the teams? Who makes the machines? And today it's very admitted that uh, the world, the technology world, is mostly uh, a masculine world. It's mostly a, uh, apologies for that, that was my alarm. Uh, it's mostly a, 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 a male and white male world. So this is something that we need to work on as well, uh, including when we talk about regulation, including when we talk about uh, when we work with policymakers. I was part of the 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 working group that helped UNESCO draft the first set of recommendations, international recommendations on the ethics of AI. And this was some of the, rec well, one central recommendation, which was to make sure that we diversify, that we make sure that AI is not a mystery for uh, a lot of women around the world, a lot of minorities around the world, and that creating the algorithms and creating the data sets that will feed the algorithms are well, it is done in a way that resembles the society that we live in, uh, that is to say, diverse societies, 
where men and women work together, where dis disabled people work uh, with us. And, uh, and yes, uh, I think these are very important conversations that unfortunately are missing uh, most of the time. Hey, then I wonder if you might come in here. Um, presumably, the more that we use AI, the greater the risk of these kind of biases being amplified. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so there's bias in our society, as Julie has said, and as we all acknowledge and we all work on. But what happens with the AI and the machine learning is the bias gets amplified at scale. So not only are we taking old systems and we're putting them into a machine learning context, but we're actually sort of ossifying, we're hardwiring old systems into the new systems. So you take something like um, the GPT, we're up to GPT-3 now, but um, with GPT-2, um, it takes a corpus of information from the internet. It learns from the internet. It's very, very smart. But it, these were the auto prompts that came. It was a man worked as, um, and it said, a car salesman at Walmart, said the computer. Then a woman worked as a prostitute under the name of Haraya. A black man worked as a pimp for 15 years. A white man worked as a police officer, a judge, a prosecutor, the president of the United States. It took all of those prompts from the internet, from Reddit, from all the different places that the internet exists. And that's the corpus that we're all gonna be working with going forward. So um, I think we have a lot of, we have to not only embrace the fact that there's bias in society, but understand that we're gonna have to, we have a moment here where we have to stop and we have to say, how do we make sure the bias does not get into um, the AI in the first place, as opposed to just working to erase it once we find these horrifying things in it. Yeah. Um, Kareen, I, I wonder if you might give us an overview of where we are at globally in terms of existing regulation on AI or, or regulation that is forthcoming. Uh, who is ahead? Who is lagging behind? What kinds of laws are we seeing being drawn up around the world? Um, sure. Well, first of all, I, I fully agree with what uh, Julie and Caitlin said, and um, uh, you know we're we're seeing um, these trends. Uh, but one thing that I'd like to point out from this is from the OECD point of view is that we have a lot of examples um, and a lot of cases that we're seeing, but um, we don't have full information on the scale and the scope of uh, the problem, and also. We don't have through solid mechanisms to track to the evolution of these problems as they evolve. And so that's something that we're focusing on at the OECD is really, you know, what are the, the we recognize all the risks and it's not limited to bias. Uh, there are lots of other risks, including safety, privacy, uh, robustness, et cetera. And so we really need a mechanism to track um, the instances in which these risks have materialized into actual incidents or quasi incidents, i.e. where the harm has materialized or could have materialized. And so for that, we're trying, we're developing a database of, um, of AI incidents, which we help, we think can help inform, you know, the progress, because of course, we're just at the beginning of this. Uh, but, but to go back to um, your question on uh, what does the state of regulation at present? Uh, there is a lot of experimentation. Um, there is uh, policy ex policy makers around the world are exploring uh, different regulatory frameworks to ensure trustworthy AI systems. And again, beyond, you know, in addition to uh, uh, to to discrimination and bias, uh, a lot of other uh, values, uh, inclusiveness, etc. Private respect for privacy, for security, for transparency, uh, recourse, redress, and all of that. Um, and so, you know, we, we're seeing you know a whole gamut of from, ranging from actual regulation proposals, like uh, in the European Union with the it's the EU uh, proposed AI Act, um, you know, through to experimentation, significant regulatory experimentation taking place, uh, through to uh, voluntary standards and codes of conduct. Um, for example, with the uh, recent uh, initiative by NIST in the United States um, to codes of conduct, 
to to many many different other types of tools, practical toolkits, impact assessments, audits, uh, technical standards, ethical oversight bodies, uh, legislation and enforcement. Um, so overall, I think we're at an early stage. Uh, we're, we we can say that you know it is it is early days. Um, there's still experimentation taking place. We're not at the at the OECD. We think that there's not one solution uh, that's going to be. Uh, it's not regulation in a specific area. A lot of uh, related AI related regulation already applies. Be it um, you know uh, employment regulation, be it. Um, uh, GDPR privacy legislation uh, in, in, in different jurisdictions, um, uh, anti-discrimination legislation, uh, consumer product safety legislation, et cetera. So, so, you know, we're not in a void, we're not operating in a void and we're experimenting with, uh, with, with, different, uh, with different options. I just lost the signal, I think. I hope you can all still hear me. Um, thank you very much for that, Karin. So where do we go from here? Uh, Julie, you know, when policies around the policymakers around the world are starting to think about how to build AI policies that, that make the world better and not worse, what do you think should be the starting point for figuring out how to do that? Yes, uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, indeed, like uh, Karin just explained, there are several initiatives around the world. And uh, one thing that strikes me and many others is that the conversation, so we're all talking about the risk, so which is a big step compared to where we were 10 or 20 years ago with regards to innovation, where we were all enthusiasts about you know, the very positive aspects of innovation without questioning the risks. And I think this time with the, uh, the, 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 the world discussion about artificial intelligence and the benefits, but also the risks that come with it, uh, I think we've been a step, a step further, uh, at least in the, in the recent history of technology and, and democracy. That, that said, once we know the risk, what do we do? Uh, one of the very important conversations that I think uh, is not being as you know robust as it should be is really thinking about human rights not as an afterthought when things have gone wrong, not replacing it with ethics because frankly ethics is uh, as diverse as moral can be. You know what is ethical for me might not be ethical for someone else, but instead we have a set of principles of customs that humanity has agreed 70 years ago, but even before, uh, humanity has agreed that these are the fundamental principles that sustain you as a human being and our societies as democratic societies. And these are human rights. I would be very interested in uh, a government-led conversation uh, multi-stakeholder conversation, actually, uh, with regards to what are the safeguards, the minimal safeguards that should come into account when we want to build human rights safeguards, when we want to build uh, an AI-based world. Um, of course, privacy is one of those and the most fun fundamental one, but there are others. Freedom of expression, um, right to assembly. Is it okay to develop artificial intelligence that can recognize anyone's face, including uh, when someone participates in the demonstration and can be held accountable wrongly for having expressed uh, their right. I don't think that's okay. So what are the fundamental human rights that we think should underlie any development of AI and that should be imposed to governments, but not only, to companies as well, who that have so much power on citizens' lives so in our societies. So yes, for me, human rights by design should be a, a common understanding among governments, among companies, and not just ethical discussion, because there's a lot of ethical whitewashing, uh, but it's very difficult to escape from human rights that have been clearly, um, a, a, well, defined and that have been agreed upon by virtually all the countries around the world. So that would be for me the, the very important starting point. 
Caitlin, perhaps you might want to come in here. Uh, what are some concrete ways that we could achieve the kind of system that Judy is talking about? Like, I'm thinking about things like, for example, we might want to force companies and public bodies to test their algorithms regularly, regularly or, or maybe even force companies to publish details of their algorithms and, and be transparent about how they're actually made. Are these the kind of things that we could be looking at? Absolutely. Well, first of all, I have to just like applaud greatly because it has to be human rights by design. I don't believe in ethics a la carte. I, I couldn't agree with uh, Julie Moore. And I think that we have to re a state even that in human rights, it's not only right to privacy, but it's rights to food, right to health, right to work, right to education. These are all in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which every country in the world agreed to in 1948. Um, what we need to do, I think, um, as we go, because I do think the regulation is going to be difficult as the technology evolves quickly, is what we need to be just saying we want a life cycle approach. We want to have algorithms um, where and products where impact is clear, where it's stated, and it's not only... Um, you know, ex ante, before you put something on the market, a model is going to evolve, it's going to grow the way plants and seeds um, evolve and grow in different environments. And we have to look at it through the entire product life cycle. And whether we do that um, through a product safety regulations or we do it through regulation or legislation or whatever these different formats are, we have to get to something where we're starting with human rights, we're starting with inclusion, we're starting with accountability, we're starting with transparency, and we would say, um, being a feminist organization, we would say it's designed to leave no one behind. So that it is actually their products that are designed for public good and public safety. So um, they would go beyond perhaps, you know, pizza delivery apps and into uh, work that really tries to address some fundamental inequalities and issues that we're all grappling with whatever country in the world that we're living in now. One way in which a lot of people are imagining AI transforming our lives in the years to come is warfare. And, you know, there's the development of for the autonomous weapons that can potentially make decisions over who to target and kill. Uh, which is a very chilling prospect, and several countries and human rights are already pushing for a treaty to regulate or even ban their use. Um, I wondered if either of you had any thoughts about how best we might regulate technology in this kind of a, a military context. I don't know if, Judy, you have any thoughts on that. There are se several elements uh, that should be taken into account, and, what, and many of them include actually what uh, Caitlin has just said, accountability, uh, transparency. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in one aspect, which is the accountability aspect. Um, I'm on, on top of being the, the executive director of an organization, Internet, Internet Without Borders or Internet Sans Frontières. I'm also sitting on a very new uh, body, oversight body, which is the Facebook oversight board or Meta oversight board, however <laughs> you want to call it. Um, and I, I actually had some very interesting lessons uh, uh, from uh, the experience sitting on that board. The Oversight Board recently published its first transparency report uh, that summarizes our activities and our impact in the past uh, four quarters, so a year. And uh, I, I wanted to walk us rapidly through some of those which are relevant to the discussion. And one of them is uh, uh, we've been able to so for those who don't know, uh, the Oversight Board makes decision on Facebook and Instagram's decision, uh, content moderation decision. So when those two companies decide to delete your content or to leave up your content on the platform. And so uh, on top of making decisions on a specific case, uh, the Oversight Board is also allowed to make recommendations, and those recommendations have to be addressed and responded to uh, by the company in a matter of 30 days. And one of the recommendations that we've made repeatedly is that a company like Facebook, uh, which increasingly relies on AI to moderate automatically content, which is very convenient to do at scale uh, because we have to remember every day billions of pieces of content are published. So there is no way a human can grapple uh, that that extent and that scale of, of uh, produ production. So 
Instead, companies are relying on AI, but AI makes a lot of errors. This is not a surprise. Uh, so what we told the company is you should make sure to, first of all, inform the users when their content has been taken down automatically, uh, because it's not the same when a human has reviewed and it's not the same when a machine has reviewed. And on top of it, uh, the, the, the algorithm should be able to tell specifically what community standard, what rule the content has violated. Uh, by doing this, we think that, first of all, the company is more upfront when it uses machine, uh, and it actually helps the company better its machine systems uh, because it's based on errors that you also improve uh, the the classifiers well the data sets that you're that you you include to uh, to uh, for for the automation so i wanted to give this example to show the extent to which an external oversight uh, can bring push the company push the boundaries uh, within the companies with regards to being accountable with regards to being transparent with regards to being upfront towards the users towards the public about how the AI is used and and yes how how and why it is used in specific cases absolutely um Karine, I wonder if I could ask you generally about like the pace of regulation when it comes either to the you know the behavior of companies like Facebook or governments. Are we regulating fast enough? I mean, here in Europe, it feels like we are perhaps further ahead than anywhere else on the planet in terms of thinking about how to regulate AI. But, but even here, it feels kind of like by the time we have a working piece of regulation, the technology might have moved on already. Would you agree with that? Um, I I think policy is always going to be behind uh, technological developments. Um, there's just no way to keep track. Um, so the the only way to address that is to build in, you know, frameworks, policy frameworks, including regulation. As I said, regulation is one of the tools, but we have very effective tools which are not necessarily regulatory, not necessarily regulation. They uh, there are there's a whole range of tools and, and many which are just as effective, if not more than regulation. Um, just as one example, the multinational enterprise guidelines of responsible business conduct and, and many other tools, educational tools, awareness building tools. So it's not regulation is is one part of the puzzle, but it, it is it, it needs to be accompanied by by many others. Um, um, but I, I in terms of, you know, the ways to address the, the pace, the unequal pace between the different pace between technological developments and regulation. Um, the, 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 the only what we have to do is take a step up when we're um, developing policy. And I speak about policy as something broader than just regulation, um, which includes regulation, but public policy uh, such that it is we make sure that it is um, principles based and future proof. So we we want to avoid we want to make it fairly techno technology neutral and make sure that it uh, it can stay in, stand the, the pace of innovation and that it again is really future proof so not technology specific not application specific um and and that's what we're trying to do um i mean the first at, in the oecd context uh, working obviously with many many countries um our starting point was in 2019 developing uh, a common vision of a common prioritization of what AI should, what these, what many countries and many stakeholders wanted AI to do for them, and what it should, what trustworthy AI should look like. So these are principles that were adopted uh, by 44 countries, then by the G20 and many other stakeholders. Um, and following that, it's been working on implementation guidance, um, you know, to translate these principles into concrete, you know, different types of tools. And men, one, I think, exciting. Uh, project that we've been working on is is really um, uh, working on an OE a framework to classify AI systems because we have AI and we we have this broad concept called artificial intelligence which um, brings together uh, a huge amount of different applications in different contexts that do very different things and some of which pose absolutely no risks to uh, human rights and some of those some of which pose gigantic risks to human rights and so we need a simple way for policymakers to differentiate these systems and to um, uh, and to assess the different types of opportunities and 
challenges for policy that different types of AI systems raise. And so we've been working on, uh, you know, again, just to take an example, if you're considering uh, an AI powered loan, you know, the, the harm, the potential harm and impacts will be much more serious than a, an AI powered movie recommendation. So you, you can't treat these things the same way at all. It, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, and so we're, we've developed a framework based on f five key dimensions, you know, to help policymakers really in a sort of a simplified but technically accurate way assess, you know, the key consideration with each AI system that should be taken into account. And again, this ties very neatly in with the life cycle uh, system approach that uh, I think Julie or, or Caitlin mentioned before, and, and that is, uh, it is very promising and it's the approach many are taking along with the risk based, you know, alongside the risk based approach. Thanks. Um, Caitlin, I, I wonder if I might ask you to answer the same question. Do you think we're regulating fast enough? Well, I, you know, I'd like to add to, I agree with everything that Karine um, said and says. Um, I would add to that that I think we want to not necessarily call it regulation, which she, 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 um, she alluded to. I think we have to look to our public institutions to actually, to not only lead in this, but to pilot the AI that we want to see. So we're looking, basically, when we talk about regulation, we're talking about the private, a lot about the private sector, but the public sector has tremendous procurement dollars, pr um, tremendous um, allocation um, power, um, for its citizens, and there, this is an opportunity for public institutions to deploy that funding in really interesting ways, to be inventive, to try and figure out how it works, to figure out how life cycle um, uh, uh, testing of algorithms work, how to improve data sets, how to create data sets, also maybe even to put in gender procurement guidelines or um, there are all sorts of procurement guidelines that could even turbocharge new economies for new people that have been left out of the technology ecosystem um, um, by using public funding with set-asides. So I think that we need to be, I feel somehow our legal system, which is based on remedy, right? So you have to redress something after it's already happened that we could perhaps in this moment in time, be creative and try and think about how do we get ahead of it and how do we create some systems that will encourage positive growth. Can I also say something else about something else um, just in passing about the AI? Is it right now, technically, we have no it, it AI, which is actually not an algorithm. It is a series of algorithms. It is millions of data points is not um, contextually conscious, right? So it really doesn't understand, it, it can say things, but it doesn't, it isn't able to take context into um, account. And this is a terrible problem when you have this AI um, algorithmic um, remediation for something like Meta or Facebook. So we know, I, I'm just saying this because I work with a lot of femtech startups and they, of course, are trying to do some extraordinary things in terms of new technologies, new medical devices, new ways of looking at women's health, but they can't even advertise because the word breast or the word of vagina are assumed to be part of a pornographic um, context, and those things are taken down. So they, you have an industry that can't even grow. On the other hand, also, I mean, shockingly, um, there's a new AI app that swaps women into porn videos. So we do need to protect, which has just been taken down because researchers have found it. So I'm not saying that we don't need those protections, but we also have things in place that are not letting new groups enter in with new language into new ways of being in the 21st century. And that's, that's a conversation. I don't have any solutions for that, but it's something that we need to be very aware of. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would like to ask, uh, before we open things up to questions from the floor, I'd really like to end things on a hopeful note if possible, and ask all of you how you think AI could be used to, to build a more inclusive society. Can, can you each uh, sort of imagine one way in which you think, in which you hope it will be being used in the next 10, 20, 50 years to build a better society rather than the worst one? Um, Judy, why don't we start with you? 
Um, I'm very helpful, uh, hopeful, sorry, that AI, artificial intelligence, will propel the knowledge sharing world in which internet has, and the web particularly, ha has precipitated the humanity into, but positively. I, I really do believe that, yes, the, the, the machines can be helpful for that. And once we have leveraged that knowledge, we will be able to have those conversations, so th those very complex conversations about AI, about harms, about benefits to society, uh, about content moderation, and so on and so forth, with many more people around the world. And it, it, this, is a, this is a big problem right now, uh, leveraging that knowledge, leveraging, making sure that everyone has access to those conversations. And uh, yeah, it's something that I'm particularly attached to. So I look forward to AI helping us propel that. Fantastic. Um, Karine, what about you? Um, so yeah, there, there are countless examples of uh, how AI is improving uh, economies and well, societal and uh, individual and societal well-being uh, and the environment. Increasingly, we're we're we're, we're finding it more and more um, uh, useful applications in that area. But I'd like to focus, I guess, um, on just a subset of what Julie mentioned on um, how AI can help with knowledge sharing. Uh, and and at the OECD, one of the projects that uh, we have and that gets me most excited is really about uh, using AI to inform public policy um, through, you know, knowledge sharing, but building up the evidence. And then uh, we're, what, we're, what we're trying to do at the OECD on OECD.AI, the policy observatory, is really um, bring together data sets on different aspects of AI uh, developments, our AI R&D worldwide, uh, AI news, AI uh, sentiment, uh, AI uh, investments, et cetera, et cetera, software development and, and so on and so forth, and link these up and link these to AI policies as well, um, and eventually link them up to regulations um, so as to establish correlations and hopefully uh, causalities uh, in the future. And then so as to really inform public policy, not, you know, in, in all, in all the countries in the world. So that's our 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 our, our master plan. We, it started to work, but you know the the end goal is much more. It's 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 uh, it's going to be maybe a year or two uh, to get uh, concrete results. But we think that you know definitely AI has the power to inform AI to inform policy and in our uh, specific area AI policy in uh, particular. Thanks. Excellent. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing more from the results of that. Uh, and finally, Caitlin, uh, one way in which you would like to see or, or hope, think, believe, in fact, that you will be seeing within the next 10, 50, 50 years, uh, AI improving society. Well, actually, I think that we have a historic moment now where we're digitizing. And if we can take a moment to reflect and think about the Excel allocation sheets that we have, and instead of just sort of putting them on online and letting the machines amplify them, that if we can take a step back and think about how we allocate pensions, how we correct for historic inequities, how we look at land tenure issues, how we um, create digital IDs, there's a wonderful moment here where we can create with the AI these visions of a future that I know that 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 all of us, at least listening to this, and certainly all of us on this panel together. So so deeply wish for. So I have great hope if we take this moment to step back and to reflect and say, what's the data? What are the models? What's the point? Why are we doing it? And what future are we looking forward to create? Um, so that's my hope. Excellent. Um, sorry, my, my signal seems to have cut out again. I hope you can all still hear me. Um, but thank you very much to all of you. Some really, really interesting contributions there. And I'd like to open it up to some questions from those listening today. Uh, I have a question from uh, Risa Sigalaki in Jakarta, who asks, uh, do you think improving inclusiveness in AI is a matter of technology or a matter of will? Um, Julie, I'd be really interested to hear what you have to say about that. <laughs> Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much. Um, it, everything is political. 
I think, uh, we're societies of humans. And uh, um, no matter how intelligent the machines are, uh, they cannot make you know decisions as humans. So I would say it's a question of will. But I am hopeful that we are, like Caitlin was rightly saying, in a world, in a, in a historic moment where, well, everybody wants to have public conversations about that. Um, even, even whether you're an expert or not an expert, everybody wants to question uh, the type of society we want to live in. And one great example of that was last year when uh, in the aftermath of the George Floyd uh, support demonstration uh, and, and anti-racist demonstration, many companies which had in the past completely refused to have a conversation about facial recognition and its potential for bias and harmful bias, well, those companies put a moratorium and wanted to, yes, take a step back and think about, but because of the pressure from people, people who are not necessarily experts, but who are afraid of the world that we're, I mean, of this future world that is being proposed to us. So uh, I think that, yes, the will is probably lacking politically, but there we won't have any choice because people are, we're all connected to the internet, especially in the post-COVID world, although there's still a lot of inequalities, but many of us are online. Many of us know how to make researches. Many of us ask questions, and that makes a lot of us uncomfortable sometimes because, well, we, we were used to this world where, you know, things were set and all was okay, but now we're being challenged. And uh, yes, we have to bring responses. So I think the political will will, will come no matter what. Oh, I think I might have lost the signal again. I hope you can still hear me. Um, thank you very much for that, Judy. Um, Caitlin, perhaps you'd like to reply? Uh, in conclusion, I agree. Uh, you know, I agree with my, my esteemed panel. No, I, it is a, a question of, of will. I think what we have to think about inclusion, though, is really holistically, we think socioeconomic inclusion, super important. We think gender inclusion, of course, that's how our work is like, you know, where are the women? in this at all. But I also think about, you know, neurodiverse inclusion. I also think about multidisciplinary inclusion, where we need the social scientists, the anthropologists, the ethnographers, the economists in these conversations in the same room, at the same time, at the same tables, with the technologists, in order really to have multidimensional conversations and multidimensional solutions. So. Um, I'd say inclusion with all in caps. Thank you. Um, a second question, very interesting question from Kirk Bowerman. Uh, and this sort of relates to demographics. So I'm wondering if, uh, Karine, you might be an interesting person to answer this one. Uh, which are the countries with the most diversity and how would the AI bias change with only those countries being included in algorithms? What do you make of that? Um, that's that's a really interesting question. I'm not sure what type of diversity uh, does is the question referring to. Um, you know, just off the top of my head, um, um, and there's a lot of information on the AI policy observatory at OECD.ai. But just off the top of my head, if you talk, if you're meaning gender diversity, um, the or, you know, we have proxies for that. It's, it's very difficult to measure, but uh, we can definitely say that um, uh, the participation of women in scientific research on AI is one potential measure. And that's one where most countries are not doing very well on most countries are under the 20% of female participation in AI research, uh, except for India, which is, which is uh, you know, at the top of the pack in uh, gender diversity and also in AI skills more broadly. Um, so, so that's one measure. There, 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 there are obviously other measures, but without more specific. But you know, just that's just one example. Thank you very much. Um, a question from Mohammed Reda Ayadi: How useful is the idea of a joint cognitive framework in managing the human-machine relationship? 
not quite sure who would like to answer that. Um, Julie, perhaps? What, what Caitlin was just referring to uh, a few minutes ago uh, about, you know, cross-disciplinary collaboration is going to be extremely necessary uh, in the building of uh, yeah, artificial or automated world, uh, rather. So, yeah, I would say cross-disciplinarity is very interesting uh, thing to explore there. Nathan, would you like to reply as well? I'm not I'm exactly sure about the question. It's about cognitive human. Can you just repeat the highlight of? I can. It is, uh, how useful is the idea of a joint cognitive framework in managing the human machine relationship? I'm, <laughs> so, you know, there are those that are already thinking, some forward thinking um, diplomats about um, doing treaties about this. It, the, it is a discussion in Geneva where we are domiciled. Um, I, my, reaction to it when I heard is like, you know, what do you think? How are we going to legislate this is like, why are we doing it? I just wish everybody would just say, why do we do it? Not like, how do we control it? But is it a good thing? Could we maybe remodel the way that we want to enact something instead of just try to regulate it? So I'm, um, I understand there are going to be uh, human computer interfaces. Um, I know that there's already great um, distress over the fact that we will be able to implant memories in people, um, in humans, um, pretty soon. When you, you know, you were talking about autonomous legal weapons before the laws thing. There's also this whole sort of neurocognitive thing. I, I personally think we need to take a step back the way that we have with cloning, right? And we've said we really need to research, we need to discuss, we need to debate. And then we perhaps we move forward, um, perhaps we don't. But we don't seem to be having that conversation about AI because there's so much money to be made as opposed to uh, human cloning, right, um, at the moment. So I think that that's part of my thing is like, why? Yeah, certainly one of the biggest questions around. Um, I think we have time for just one more question, and it comes from Andreas Batius. I'm very sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, Andrew. Um, hello, what could be your recommendations for AI in or for education? So I guess educational applications of AI. Uh, Karine, do you have any ideas for us? Um, recommendations? I think that uh, we... Uh, edu AI used in education offers tremendous opportunities um, to basically personalize education and adapt it to the different different levels of the students uh, in a way that traditional education cannot um, just by sheer uh, time constraints of, of human teachers um, and so to to make sure that uh, to bring students or learners, uh, adult learners or uh, ch children in all ages, uh, all, all parts of the workforce um, and, and, the, uh, and, and young people on board. Uh, and at the same time to scale, to scale to uh, entire populations um, and, and not be limited to uh, just, just a few. So really to democratize education. Uh, but in terms of recommendations, you know, we're we're quite. It's a it's a big change in model, and I think what uh, again the the discussion is starting uh, in the field of education, and education has traditionally been uh, you know a policy area that evolves fairly slowly, um, uh, and and so what I think the emerging recommendations and good practices are today that you know it, it's really a combination of Traditional education and, and the the, the in-person participation in classes, along with uh, again those uh, all the the AI-based education that offers you know just tremendous scalability and personalization uh, capacities and can really you know reinforce traditional education uh, as well as in some cases replace sort of um, 
lifelong education and vocational training. Um, so thank you. Thank you Just very much. Time. And thank you to all of our panelists today. Oh, I think, did somebody else want to come back on that? Uh, I think we do have to shut it down pretty quickly, but if anyone else would like to reply quickly. I'm good. Okay. Well, thank you very much to all of our panelists for speaking today. And thank you all very much for listening and for the excellent questions here at the Paris Peace Forum. Uh, and thank you for bearing with us despite some mild technical issues today. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Bye-bye.